Welcome to the Ray Hanania Radio Show, brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network and sponsored by Arab News, the leading English-language newspaper in the Middle East at ArabNews.com. It is Thursday, November 21, and this is Season 4, Episode 15. This week on the Ray Hanania Radio Show, we discuss two topics. The first, on what Arab Americans should do when Donald Trump returns to the White House. Should they boycott him again like they did before? To help us answer that question, we speak with Ned Fawaz, the president of the Lebanese International Business Council and the founder of the American Arab Chamber of Commerce in Michigan. He is also the founder and CEO of Energy International Corporation, a U.S.-based company with 10 branches in the Middle East, specializing in mechanical and electrical engineering, manufacturing, and supplies. Then we discuss the rising anti-Arab racism and Islamophobia and the discriminatory way that elected American officials address the Arab community in differently and in contrast to the hyper-responsive way they address the pro-Israel and Jewish community. We talk with civil rights attorney David Shammy, who is originally from Detroit and is now in Arizona, about the continued and shocking incidents of racist anti-Arab attacks and Islamophobia by pro-Israel activists, angry at seeing people carrying Palestinian flags or wearing clothing that says Palestine. The Ray Hanania Show is broadcast live every Thursday at 5 p.m. on WNZK AM 690 Radio and rebroadcast on Monday at 5 p.m on the U.S. Arab Radio Network in Michigan. It is also available online at arabnews.com slash show and on facebook.com slash arabnews. Get more information on me at arabnews.com or on my personal website at www.hanania.com. We'll be right back with our guests right after this message. Arabnews.com bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Hey, Michigan, let's think beyond the sink and learn where the water your family drinks every day comes from. Private wells and public water supplies allow homes across Michigan to draw water from different sources, like lakes, rivers, and groundwater. Tap into the facts about your home's water source and learn about your home's water quality to protect your family's health. Visit michigan.gov slash care for MI drinking water. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Life for Relief and Development has now been rated as one of the best charities for humanitarian aid. Life's humanitarian projects span the globe, and Life is celebrating its 30th anniversary of providing essential life-saving aid to people and communities in 36 countries, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. Where there is life, there is hope. And when disaster occurs here or around the world, including being one of the first responders to the Turkey-Syria earthquake crisis, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. We are looking to help the earthquake victims, and we take 0% overhead on emergency donations. So please help improve these efforts. Learn more about our involvement to help the helpless and bring hope where it's needed most. And make your tax-deductible donation to Life for Relief and Development now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. That's 248-424-7493. And welcome back to the Ray Hanania Radio Show here at WNZK AM 690 in Detroit. Uh, it is uh, Thursday, November 21st. Uh, and this season four, episode 15, we only have about four episodes left uh, for this season. But I'm really honored to uh, introduce my first guest uh, this evening, Ned Fawaz. Ned Fawaz is the president of the Lebanese International Business Council and the founder of the American Arab Chamber of Commerce in Michigan. He is also the founder and CEO of Energy International Corporation, a U.S.-based company with 10 branches in the Middle East, specializing in mechanical, electrical engineering, manufacturing, and supplies. Mr. Fawaz, thank you so much for joining us on radio today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So there's so many things uh, that uh, we can talk about, but let's first talk about you know, the uh, uh, conflict that's taking place in Gaza and that expanded into uh, Lebanon. 
Do you see a, a solution that uh, can bring peace to that region, given everything that's happened? How do you react to what we've been watching now for more than a year? Um, since this war started in Gaza and then expanded to Lebanon, uh, here in the United States, the Lebanese community and the Arab American community in general has been asking for ceasefire, that they should have a peaceful settlement, they should have a just settlement, uh, possibly two, um, two countries' solutions, um, and uh, have a recognized border for Israel and the Arab countries, so at least know, each one knows the rights, so we will have peaceful, long-term peaceful relations. But did not this take place? We've been talking about peace agreements in uh, Gaza for last year and a couple of months, and then we're talking about peace in Lebanon, but I don't see it happening for now. Um, it's very, very difficult. It's very sad that what has happened in Gaza with all these um, casualties and injured people and refugees, and the same thing is happening in Lebanon, where now we're probably over 6,000 people dead and a million and a half people are left their homes. Um, and uh, it's a disaster. It's really very, very sad. It we should stop this war immediately. Do you see a responsibility uh, or a failure in responsibility to hold Israel accountable? I mean, by the United Nations, by the United States, by the international community. I mean, it seems that Israel can just do whatever it wants. Um, unlike other countries like Russia and Ukraine and uh, North Korea and all these different places. For some reason, Israel can attack and invade another country and uh, nobody will stop it. What do we do? Well, absolutely. Uh, Israel has the full support and the veto right of the United States. It has support militarily. It has support economically, financially, uh, and they really do not control the Israeli government the U.S. government, in our opinion, does not control the Israeli government or they're really joining with them. They really don't care about what's happening. So what's going on now is that we are using the U.S. taxes to destroy property, to kill people, to send weapons, unlimited weapons, unlimited supplies. And it's against the U.S. policy of using military weapons that we supply to other countries to destroy uh, civilians and destroy buildings and destroy infrastructure, but it's happening and no one can stop them. Apparently, the way it appears, that Israel controls the policy of the United States. Whatever they want, it can be done. And they will, we will pay for it. Here in the U.S., we will pay for whatever they want. And uh, I know that the war in Gaza and Lebanon was a major part of the election campaign that we just saw finish. Um, first, we thought President Biden would uh, run for re-election. Then he withdrew after that debate in Atlanta. His performance was terrible. Um, they quickly nominated and replaced him with uh, his vice president, Kamala Harris. There seemed to be, a, you know, the Middle East seemed to be one of the issues, but it apparently hasn't had an impact whatsoever in changing the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, Gaza and Lebanon, uh, Israel's conduct continues today as if it were a year ago. There's been absolutely no change. What do you make of this? You see what happened, the Democrats uh, do not want the war to be started, sorry. And uh, they, they don't want the war to be stopped. Uh, and the Democrat has not yet called for ceasefire. Uh, this is what happened, are uh, the communities, the Arab American communities, they wanted, they always voted Democrats. Uh, right. and especially in Michigan, uh, Democrats used to win Michigan by the Arab American uh, votes. But this year, we were waiting for the president for Harris to call for a ceasefire. They did not call for a ceasefire. They did not say they will stop the war. So Trump came in and he said, I will stop the war. I will call for a ceasefire. And this is what changed the whole thing. So the community voted mostly for Trump. They voted either Republican or they voted uh, independent. Very few votes went to the Democrats in, in reverse. In, um, I can give you some numbers. 
in uh, sure. in twenty twenty in in uh, twenty twenty, Biden received eighty two percent of the votes of the Arab American community in Dearborn area. Trump received eighteen percent only, uh, and um, this year this vote. Trump received 45% of the Arab American vote. Stein received 30% of the Arab American vote, and Harris received 23%. This is because they did not call for a ceasefire. They did not stop the war. Trump came in and saying, I will stop the war. I will say that was it. Uh, ceasefire. Uh, but he did not specify, this have to be careful here, that promise before election is different from commitment after election. So we don't see, except that, yes, he's trying to stop the war. There's negotiation going, going on, but it's been going on for a year over in, in Gaza and nothing happened. So we hope that this will happen soon. It will stop the destruction of Lebanon and civilians, death of civilian uh, in, in Lebanon. But is he going to settle the war at whose expense? At the Lebanese expense? At the uh, Palestinian expense? or at the Israeli expense, or as fair. This we don't know yet. We'll wait to see. But at least someone gave you hope. The other group did not give us any hope at all. I know, I know prior to the presidential election on November 5th, there was some hope that maybe uh, Arab and Muslim Americans and supporters could help give enough strength to a third party to create a different type of political situation in the United States. Clearly, that did not happen. Uh, Jill oh. Stein got less than 1% of the vote, not even close to 1% of the vote. She needed 5% to be a party. Um, that option seems dead. So we're left with two parties that say things to us, and sometimes they don't listen to us. Is it their fault, or is it our fault as a community? Well, as a community, we really don't have the power in votes, num number of votes, uh, and the financial capabilities that other parties have. So uh, Stein got 30% of our vote. Well, this is more than 5% uh, that you want. But that's the rest of the nation did not give it any vote. Uh, right. Michigan uh, voted Republican. Normally, Michigan is Democrat. But Republican this time, because of the Arab American and Muslim American, they voted uh, for Trump. They voted Republicans or independent, but not having enough vote for Stein, it's not the uh, responsibility of the uh, Arab American or the Lebanese. What happened, we're not really yet a major group, we're only a few millions in the United States, and I don't think we can uh, dictate a policy all over the United States, but certain uh, states, we might have a certain voice to convert the state one way or the other, especially when the state is equal, one half is Democrat, half is Republican, then you take 100,000 Arab American votes, yeah, they make the difference. But throughout the United States, we're not yet that powerful to make the difference. So a third party really is not an option No to fight for that. No, third party is not happening now. I doubt if it happened unless you have a very strong candidate and uh, this is the opportunity that we don't have a two vo very strong candidate between Biden and, 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 uh, and Trump, uh, but apparently third party did not have a very strong candidate. Uh, and most Americans are not really like, too concerned with uh, pol international politics, so they right. only vote based on domestic policy more than international policy. What do you think is the message to the Democratic Party? Because as you say, I mean, originally when I was young, the Arab American community was very conservative and Republican. Then over the years, they shifted to the Democratic Party, believing that maybe the Democrats being more liberal, less rigid, would help bring about a peace in the Middle East. This last election, as you point out correctly, we shifted away from the Democratic Party. Can the Democratic win Arab American voters back? And what do they need to do? Um, I, surely they can't change anything now, but four years from now, are we destined to see this type of uh, slap 
to push us away? Or can the Democratic Party change? And is there a role that Arab Americans can play in making that change happen? As I said before, Arab Americans can make a role, can play a role in various, some states, in swinging states. But in major states like California, where the voting, you have 40 million people, or New York, uh, they're really a minority, and they really do not uh, make much difference in those states. But in swinging states, if there's 100,000 votes or 50,000 to 100,000, yes, they can make the difference. Um, this time, apparently, we split between Republicans, Democrats, uh, and Independents. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we'll have a united front and we can all vote for one party or the other. But it's going to take a lot of organization. Of course, um, we have leaders in the Democratic Party. We have leaders in the Republican Party, Arab Americans who are in the Rep Republican Party, in the Republican may and being mayors, being uh, executive, county executive. Uh, they have to stick with their party. So it's very difficult to have one group to, to go one direction. And I'm not in the favor of having one group voting for one direction. I think we should split our vote and some people work with both. So we'll have at least an avenue for the party that wins that we can continue the dialogue and talk about peace and talk about settlement, talk about the human rights that we would like to see. So four years ago, when Biden was uh, elected, he rewarded uh, Arab Americans who supported him by, uh, you know, implementing what he called a partnership with the Arab community. He appointed 24, almost 20, 24 Arab Americans and Muslims to key uh, positions in the White House and the State Department. But almost almost immediately, they were muzzled. You couldn't interview any of them. They were they had no public role. They worked in the administration, but they were not allowed to talk. Um, what do you see happening with the Trump administration, which receives much support, as you point out, from Arab Americans? Will he respond to us, or do we have to continue to make the case with him? What should we do, and what do you expect from Trump? I think we should continue to make the case with him, because the way he's selecting his uh, cabinet, uh, it is 100% pro-Israel. And he has not selected any Arab American to any position. That doesn't mean does not mean it. He will not select. But until he selected, we are saying he's not. He hasn't selected any Arab American. There are some capable Arab Americans in the administration. Uh, I mean, in 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 politics all over the United States, and he can select someone who is fair. He can speak our voice, uh, but he has not. We have been meeting with. Uh, uh, Masoud Masoud Yunus uh, Bulos, and he is trying his best to be the uh, coordinator, to be the liaison between Trump and the Lebanese community. We hope he succeeds. We hope that he gives him some position, that he has some power, but he hasn't done that so far. So we don't know what's happening, but all we see is positions that have been given to um, not only I, I'm not saying the pair of Americans or a pro Arab American, but they're anti um, um, Arab and pro Zionist all the way through. So what I will have to wait and see what happened. We have written, we're not, a, we have written a letter to the president uh, requesting that we participate, that we will have his voice. Uh, it was it received by the president. We have not received a reply yet. Who uh, wrote the letter with you? I mean, who were some of the people or the individuals involved? Well, they, there were um, about six uh, Republicans um, led by uh, Faye Nimmer, the president of the MENA Chamber of Commerce. MENA is uh, a Middle East and North African Chamber of Commerce. Uh, a couple of three doctors who are, um, uh, they are uh, Republicans and they work with the President Trump the people we met with President Trump when he arrived, when he came to Dearborn, uh, those six people uh, work on that uh, and send it to him in the name of the community. But we have not received any reply yet. But we still should engage, as we talked earlier in uh, 
when Trump was elected in 2016, we voted really against Hillary Clinton because of her policies in Gaza and the Middle East and how she allowed the conflicts there to go longer than normal. So Trump benefited from our anger. And it seems like he benefited from our anger this time. But last time when he was president, we boycotted him. Uh, we did not engage him. Every president, I think, in this country is pro-Israel. They're going to appoint people that are happy, that make the pro-Israel movement, uh, you know, uh, in, in their, you know, they'll put him in their administration. Um, but I didn't see, uh, do you think that it'll be different this time, that we would engage the president to talk to him, um, mm -hmm. make sure, is it, a, is it a bad thing to boycott him again? No, because we don't bad. like the appointments. No, it's bad to boycott. After all, we're American. We have issues just other than the Middle East as well. And I think we should all dialogue and talk and be ready to communicate uh, with the president, with any administration, um, because we cannot just sit aside and do nothing. Um, yes, always negotiation uh, uh, makes better sense than boycotting. Uh, we believe in evolution. We do not believe in revolution. So that's the way it should be. And uh, whoever the president of the United States, we need to work with them. We need to look after the future of our people here in the United States as well as the people in the Middle East. We have two issues to think about. One is our position here in the U.S., our future, our children, our community, uh, what's going on. And then we have issue in the Middle East, like everybody else have an issue overseas. The Ukrainian has a problem in Ukraine. Um, in Yemen, the Yemeni has a problem. Um, uh, every country has a problem. The community here works with the administration to try to make sense to uh, explain to the administration their position. Hopefully they can be fair and that's all we want. We want people to be fair. We don't want people to be on our side against the other side. No, let's be fair to both sides. Now, I, I know that there's been a lot of reaction to his cabinet appointees. Uh, um, you know, the, his uh, UN ambassador is a uh, uh, congresswoman from New York, Elise Stefanik, who's been very anti-Arab. But her voice is at the United Nations, which is very pro-Palestinian, pro-Lebanon, and pro-Arabs. So I wasn't surprised by that. Uh, Marco Rubio, um, he's the uh, senator from Florida. He's going to be secretary of state. He's been critical of the Arab world. But I, when I look back at Trump's first administration, I saw that his first appointments did not last long in, in his cabinet during his first term. He had a revolving door. He appointed people. They lasted six months, eight months, maybe a year, and they were replaced by new people. There were so many changes. Is that something that uh, we could work on to help bring about change in Trump's cabinet? Um, and did you see anybody in Trump's cabinet so far, the nominees, that gave you some hope that maybe there's a door open to our community in this first crop and first wave of appointments? So far, we don't see any. As you state, the Secretary of State um, is a very, matter of fact, um, they, they, they sent, the ambassador to Israel um, said that there's no Palestine, no West Bank, no Palestinians. Right. Um, a lot Mike of Huckabee. Civil, yeah. The, um, yeah. Um, the um, Secretary of Defense also has uh, extreme Zionist movement. So I think um, we, even with all of that, we must continue to negotiate, continue the dialogue, to interact with the administration. Hopefully they will have some people who are uh, fair, who are good for the U.S. government, they are good for the U.S. people, good for the taxpayers, and they see some a fair issue. They will not allow this kind of a genocide that has taken place on Lebanon or in, in, in Gaza. Every day there's 100 or 150 people who died in Lebanon uh, just bombing civilians and buildings inside of civilian area. 
that's unfair and unjust, and people should see it. But the Trump, I mean, Biden administration did not see it, did not even call for ceasefire. The least you can do is say, I need, I want ceasefire. They never said that. That's why the community turned against them. So, and as we come into the final days of the Biden administration, he still is the president of the United States. He still has December and early January, I'd say maybe eight weeks, where he could take action as we saw him uh, stand up and uh, decide that Ukraine can use American weapons to attack Russia, which was a prohibition prior you know, to the election. Is it possible that Biden, in his final days and weeks, that he could take some action to bring this conflict to an end? Um, and do you think that's possible? And what would that be? What what should he do? Well, it, um, uh, someone to escalate the war in Ukraine by attacking deep into Russia and giving the missiles to do so, while Trump saying, I'm going to stop the war, this is a big conflict. Uh, that shouldn't have happened. And if a person who called to expand the war and maybe kill more civilians, he's not going to go and do anything in Lebanon or in Gaza. He's going to leave it as it is. And he's going to try to have maybe the Israeli white part of Gaza completely 100% and then do as much damage as possible in Lebanon, and maybe go in in land and take over some of the land and claim that it's an Israeli land, as they have done with the uh, uh, Golan Heights and the West Bank and different areas. So I don't hope anything the administration, president administration will do. I think they're just going in their own directions and hope that Trump will stop this uh, massacre and um, uh, at least be fair to the rest of the people. So there's no expectation that uh, President Not Biden President. can do for the Middle East what he did in Ukraine a little bit? No. Not uh, at all. We heard about negotiation going on, discussion going on, a stop the war, there are conditions. America has sent a proposal to Lebanon, and but the, the proposal they send to Lebanon did not accept. Well, what the proposal is actually, the way they present it is uh, like a surrender for Lebanon, uh, so to allow Israeli to uh, come in at any time and inspect and, uh, and et cetera, and violate, um, and they can fly over Lebanon, they can do anything they want. That's not acceptable, that's not a fair uh, agreement. Uh, so yeah, they talk about we have gonna have a peace, but let's have a fair peace so we can, we don't have a, have a war 10 years from now, every 20 years, 10 years, we're gonna have a war. Let's get it over with once and for all. And just one final question. Do you think this war will end before in Lebanon and Gaza before Trump is sworn in? Or do you see this continuing even afterwards? I think it's going to continue because the what's happening in Gaza is a year and a half. Every day they say we have a settlement, we have a new agreement, new policy. And even when uh, the... Uh, Hamas agreed uh, Israel has retreated. So yeah. I don't think I don't think we're going to be able to um, um, we're not going to be able to have uh, peace before Trump takes over and maybe after he takes over for a while. I don't know what his agenda is going to be. But uh, okay. to me, it's a dark uh, future and hope it's better for all of us. All right, my guest, Ned Fawaz, the president of the Lebanese International Business Council and the founder of the American Arab Chamber of Commerce in Michigan, USA. He also is the founder and CEO of Energy International Corporation, a U.S.-based company with uh, 10 branches in the Middle East. Um, Mr. Fawaz, it is a pleasure to talk to you always. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us to help Thank us understand you. these issues. Thank you for your time. Wish you a lot of luck. Wish the best of luck for Lebanon and for Palestine. Thank you. Okay.
ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Michigan's winter forecast is snow, snow, and more snow. And for a little variety, ice. Since that means slippery roads, stay safe by following these driving tips. Don't use cruise control on ice and snow. Use turn signals sooner to give others more time to react. Keep your car's fluids, tires, and wipers well-maintained. And most important of all, drive slow on ice and snow. A message from the Michigan Office of Highway Safety Planning. And now I want to uh, introduce my next guest, David Chami. He is a civil rights attorney, originally from Detroit, but now he's based in Arizona. He's on top of these issues of Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism. And I'll tell you, over the past 18 months, we have seen so many frightening anti-Arab and Islamophobic attacks. And the response has been very little from the elected officials when it involves Arabs and Muslims that are the victims. David, welcome to the program today. Thanks for having me, Ray. So, I mean, there's just so much. I, I don't know where to start. I mean, the one thing is, what's the situation? I mean, is it a, is a, the racism and Islamophobia, is it a major thing that's happening or is it just incidental? Something happening here, something happening there. How do we characterize what's going on? So, so there is widespread Islamophobia and uh, anti-Arab racism, and and even the Islamophobia is so bad, and the and the anti well, let's say the Islam Islamophobia is so bad that anyone who is perceived to be Muslim, whether you're Muslim or not, um, is being is facing um, Islamophobic uh, discrimination. So, if you are an Arab Christian, right? If you are a Hindu. Uh, if you are a Sikh, you are perceived to be Muslim by the general population and uh, the discrimination um, our community and adjacent communities face because of it is is rampant. The, the major problem with um, with this is that we are not a community in general that reports these crimes. So they're they're vastly underreported. Um, and we're working on that through organizations like CARE. Um, and the anti and the uh, ADC, which is the Anti Arab uh, Discrimination uh, Committee. Um, so we're working on trying to get our community to report better. But also, there's just uh, a reluctance from um, authorities to classify crimes against Arabs and uh, Muslims as um, uh, as hate crimes. It, it seems like they're. They're willing to stand up. I remember I, I I posted something on my Facebook just recently about this Newsweek column I did in 1998 about how oh, there's racism and anti-Arab and Islamophobic stuff. Um, and the government and officials would criticize it. But it seems that today it's gotten so worse, they won't rise up to the worseness of what's happening. So we have an Illinois state senator um, Sarah Feigenholtz, who has been passing along, you know, negative anti-Arab and Islamic phobic, you know, messages. And when she was confronted by it, you know, it just this uh, indignation on her part and nobody around her, nobody in the state will denounce it. And if this were Arab or Muslim, everybody would denounce it. Right. Isn't that kind of the problem? It's not just Islamophobic, but it's the hypocrisy of how it's being addressed history repeats itself, right? The Muslims in this country have grown in numbers. Um, they're more, uh, I guess, with a lot of the immigrants that have come over as refugees in the last, you know, I'd say half a century, um, the vast majority of them from Muslim countries that come over are wearing um, very clearly identifiable Muslim attire, my family immigrated here in the early 1900s, and, and my great my grandfather was born here. They came here and really attempted to assimilate in such a way that you wouldn't know. Right. Uh, as a Lebanese community, lighter complexions, not dressed in Islamic attire, 
you wouldn't know that, you know, that we were different. Um, and so we were very easy to kind of blend in. But a lot of the people that have come over in the last 30, 40 years um, are wearing the headscarves, are wearing the abayas, right? The long uh, garments. And it's very easy. And, and as we've grown in numbers, you know, people are afraid, right? And and Hollywood hasn't done us any favors with always casting the Arabs um, as terrorists. Um, so... We think Americans have been conditioned to hate us by the media, the lack of response. Uh, and there has been some response. I don't want to say nobody's responded, but the lack of consistent uh, across the board response, the way they stand up to anti-Semitism or racism against blacks or Asians or Latinos. Um, it, it just seems like it's uh, it's worse at a much higher level because when my dad came here in the 20s, yeah, there was some racism, but it was mainly they didn't know us. Now it's a racism. They they think they know us in such a bad way that they feel that they're justified in being racist towards us, don't they? It's it's so so first of all, I feel like there was a shift in policy um in our government where where the Middle East uh, became sort of this uh we, we're going to, I mean, and I, I don't want to say it started in 2001 after 9-11 because I think it existed right. before then, but, but the Patriot Act um, and, and the way we conduct um, operations in the Middle East, um, and I, I feel like they decided if we call people terrorists, we can do whatever we want. It's no, look, the, the president always needed permission from Congress to enter into a war. Um but a war on terror isn't a real declared war. So now you see presidents um, doing drone strikes and, and, and you know, some secret missions and sending troops. It's not a war. It's a war right. on terror. It's collaboration. And the only way to do that is to, is to really just say they're terrorists and designate them as terrorists. And, and, and the idea that you're fighting terrorism, who's against that, right? Right. I, I remember I, I, when uh, when uh, President Obama, I think, authorized a strike against a uh, Islam uh, individual that was identified as an Islamic terrorist who used to be an American who was who left the country because he was upset. Nobody would listen to him. He goes uh, back home and uh, we author because his rhetoric is so critical of us. We authorize a strike. We kill him and his family and his son, who was an American citizen. And nobody thought anything of it. They go, oh, well, he was a terrorist. It, it, there's permission. So this is sort of the theme that has it started out, at, you know, in government. But that's carried down to um, normal civilians. Right. You look at the attack. Uh, in Chicago on uh, the six-year-old, Wadiya Al-Fayyum, right? That right. six-year-old boy was murdered, right. right? And it's easy. I don't want to say that a normal, you know, lucid person would say it's justified to murder a six-year-old. Right. But we understand there are many people who aren't normal or lucid who 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 will get angry and do what that 71-year-old man did, right? And said, right. you are a future terrorist. Right. And that's... The mentality and it's okay to kill terrorists and isn't it a, also a little difference in in this sense um yeah why do you fight you murdered nobody said that was a good thing everybody said it was a terrible thing but after they condemned it they didn't expand it to say oh we need to protect mosques we need to protect arabs we need to pass a law that says if you attack a muslim or an uh uh, or an Arab, you're going to face special circumstances. That seems to be what happens in other systems. There's an attack against somebody, and suddenly the whole state goes in lockdown over that incident. There was no lockdown with us. It was a sad, tragic news story, horrible, we denounce it, blah, 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 but nothing beyond that. We're kind of suppressed, aren't we? I mean, they really don't take us seriously as victims. So. Uh we are too easily the villains uh, for our government and for our media. And I've been, as you know, Ray, I've been um, engaged in a lawsuit against Arizona State University, right? Right. Um, for its suppression of pro-Palestine's uh, uh, protests over the ongoing uh, genocide, right? And I'll call it what I think it is, right? The ongoing yes. genocide in, 
in Gaza and now in Lebanon. And these students, most of whom were non-Arab, non-Muslim, who were protesting, who were arrested, um, it's it, the, the, the rhetoric that I'm hearing from the administration, the school, right? The, the state senators and legislators is that these protests are pro Hamas, right? Which they're not, right? These protest, which means pro terrorism, right? Um, these protests are making Jewish students feel unsafe, right? right. We're so worried, not, not because anybody, not because these protests are anti Judaism, they're not, right. but we're so worried about the perception that this anti Israeli policy protest is going to have on the poor, innocent Jewish Americans that we are willing to suppress free speech and pass bills and attempt to pass bills labeling students for justice in Palestine as terrorist sympathizers. And in fact, many universities have suspended or uh, put them on probation claiming they're supporting terrorism. Yet you see this 64 year old, five foot nothing woman attack a man twice her size. I mean, you talk about Right. The the brazenness in which she had to feel protected and emboldened to be able to do what she did, that is a, that is a systemic problem. That is a problem with our government, allowing these people to feel like I can attack an Arab, I can attack someone I perceive as Muslim or even pro-Palestinian, um, and I'm, I'll be fine. Now she was she was out of hand, but right. Of that's course, a that's a sixty four year old woman who they never identified or named her, uh, which was interesting to me. But they named the victims, um, and that was uh, was seen Zahran and his pregnant wife, who were in a uh, Panera Bread in Downers Grove, a suburb of Chicago. There's so many of these incidents I can't even keep up with them. Um, and the sixty four year old woman just for no reason starts attacking them, starts calling their names, throws coffee at them. Fortunately, the uh, DuPage County State's Attorney, Robert Berlin, uh, and the Downers Grove Police Chief prosecuted her, and she's been charged with two uh, counts of hate crime, I understand. So so I think they do identify her. I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. It's uh, Zostakowicz, I think, uh, Alexandra Zostakowicz. But in the beginning, and, they wouldn't say nothing. Believe me, yeah. if this were Arab, they would have used the Arab name because it would have exaggerated the intensity of the yeah. uh, act of racism and, and against whoever. What's so much more frustrating is that they don't identify her as a 64-year-old Jewish woman. Right, right. If it had been they, the other way around, it would be the Arab guy. 100%. Uh, and this yeah. is the bias in the media. Yeah. We would 100, our ethnicity, our religion, uh, if you're Muslim, your religion will be right. identified. If you're an Arab Christian, they don't say Arab Christian. They just call uh, me a Muslim anyway half the time. They don't they'll, care. They'll, <laughs> they'll no, say but you're Arab. right. You're right. The the identification, the level. I mean, this goes to the other th point that I was talking about. The intensity of how they respond to us is 10 times worse than the intensity of how they respond to other people. You're absolutely right. They, you know, if if Wasim Zahran had provoked the 64 year old woman, it would have been this pro Palestinian uh, terrorist supporting, you know, Hamas supporting guy and his and his pregnant wife doing this, and they're Muslim and they're attacking a poor Jewish woman who was on her way to temple. But in this yeah. case, it's. Uh, well, yeah, she's a woman. We're going to charge her. That's it. Let's leave it at that. We don't want to aggravate it anymore. Why is, why is that? Is there like a fear that it's easier to pick on us than it is on anybody else? So, so Ray, it is easier to pick on us. It, it, it is easier to pick on us. We are not organized the way the Jewish community is. We don't have uh, an APAC uh, with you know billions of dollars uh, at their disposal, I mean they spent twenty million dollars to unseat uh, Corey Bush in Missouri, and almost right. twenty million dollars to unseat Jamal Bowman. I mean, and and I don't mean to you know this is not a political conversation, but you're asking why is it yeah. easier to pick on us? It's easier to pick on us because we don't have the same resources, right. financial resources to. Uh, you know, to, to get the type of influence. That's why you see these anti-Semitism bills that are being proposed and passed in many instances. Um, and by the way, 
anti-Semitism exists. It's bad. It is. The, right. prob- the, the problem with the bills you're seeing, especially in the last year, is that these bills are not about anti-Semitism. They're about anti-Israel and anti-Zionism. And, and I feel like the politicians that are proposing them are being disingenuous. They know the difference right. between an anti-Jewish statement and an anti-Zionist statement. And they are different. They, they are Zionism isn't even religious. It is a secular ideology. Right. And the, the attack in Downers Grove with this guy as Iran, he was wearing a hoodie that had the word Palestine on the back, which intentionally was what provoked the woman to do it. And I know, and I'm going to repeat this for both of us, that we're not anti-Semitic. We're not trying to say that it's okay to attack Jewish people. That's horrible, too. We both agree on that. But the intensity of how um, if you're Arab and you do something, it's horrible. And we got to pass a law to stop you. But if you happen to be Jewish, well, we don't need to mention the religion. If you happen to be anti-Palestinian, we don't have to mention the fact that, you know, it's political. It's just, you know, uh, they, they minimize it for us and they seem to intensify it in defense of Israel. They're turning anti-Semitism into a political weapon. Well, I don't know how many people know the name Saida Mashra, right? The seven-year-old uh, Arab girl in Detroit that had her neck slit um, because you know, she didn't die, fortunately, but it was in a playground in front of dozens of people and children. Um, and so that was just a few months ago. I mean, I didn't and, and hear it's, that. Yeah, and that's the problem. How did you not hear that? You can Google right. her name. S A I D A because Mashra. the elected officials aren't the officials who are who are screaming about the other side are not screaming about what's happening to us. So yeah, your and, case, and, for and, example, and, where's your case today? You're you're representing these students. Yeah, and, no. So I'm in federal. I'm in federal court in the District of Arizona. Um, I'm about to file a separate lawsuit against. Um, uh, law enforcement, including ASU, uh, poli- the ASU Police Department, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, for uh, the four young women, Muslim women, who they arrested in that protest, their removal of their hijabs in public. Um, you know, and and this happened. The removal of their hijabs in public happened three weeks after New York City paid seventeen point five million dollars for forcing Muslim women to uh, remove their hijabs and posted their hijabless uh, mugshots um, on, in the public. So th- there's no argument that and- law enforcement is unaware of this, the importance and religious significance. They have a complete disregard for uh, for what they do to the Muslim community. And I, and I, and I don't wanna say that there aren't plenty of good officers right who would have handled it differently. The problem is the the institutions themselves don't think it's worth it to train their officers uh, on how to handle our religious, for example, the Muslim community's religious uh, observances, right? Our our requirements. And so, um, you know, I do think, I do think with education and time, it'll change. I think if we look at history, we look at the way the Irish and the Italians were treated. I know it's not quite the same um, because they at least shared a common, I would say common religion, or at least a you know, sect of Christianity that, that allows them to assimilate a little easier. Um, but there are plenty of Arab Christians uh, in the United States. Um, you know, the idea that if somebody says, Allah, that that is somehow something, you know. And My mother's Arab from Christian. Bethlehem. My mother's from Bethlehem. She's she, Christian. She says, she says Allah. Allah. There's no yeah. difference between Allah and the word God, but we've been portrayed as, oh, well, you believe in somebody else. There's such a distortion on facts. There's a distortion on uh, incidents, and there's distortion between the level of parity. Muslims and Arabs do something wrong. We're horrible. Jews and other people do something wrong. Well, it's an incident. It's a crime. We'll deal with it that way. You don't even get the facts about it, or it's not even put in a greater political context of being, you know, part of the anti-Palestinian movement. How how many uh, students are you representing at at Arizona State University? 
20 students um, and one non-student. And they were punished, right? Because they were protesting uh, by the university. Let me me tell you this. Two of the students um, were arrested upon arrival within an hour of their arrival prior without warning just getting there just got there without they were they were attempting to send a message i have emails um where where you could where between uh asu police and and maricopa county sheriffs the the plan was to arrest everyone to send a message they arrested three people who by the way their charges were dismissed um Upon arrival in the court, literally the same day, the judge said there was no probable cause for these arrests. Those two students, non-Arabs, by the way, these are just they just happen to be client, my client Harry Smith and my client Michael Clancy. They showed up within an hour. They were arrested. Those two students are still not back in school. They their suspension will end, and they will be allowed to um, complete this probationary period, uh, some some promotion, probationary uh, requirements, but they will start school in January again. Uh, all things go well, but they missed the end of last semester. So they, in some cases, failed classes um, or got lower grades. Um, and then they missed this entire semester, despite a court finding that there was no probable cause for them to even be arrested and the basis for their suspension was the arrest. Right. And so, and so the, the look, I, I will be sharing more information as I go along, Got it. but the, the, the ADL, the, you know, this is a, a Jonathan Greenblatt, which right. is, you know, see, uh, th- this is a very powerful um, uh, group. They call yeah. themselves a civil rights organization, but they're very clearly a, um, in my view, an organization that is a political organization that is intended to protect not only Jewish Americans, but more importantly, Israeli interests. Um, Jonathan Greenblatt was in direct communication with Michael Crow, the ASU president, before the protest. As soon as they got wind of a, of a protest that could happen, at it, they were calling university and emailing university presidents all across the country. There is no... Arab leader or organization that has the email address and and would receive a, an immediate and uh, response from the university president of the largest university in the country. ASU is the largest university in the country, and and that is the direct line of communication um, that the pro-Israel, the Israeli lobby has on was our a, institutions. Was it a coordination? You mean like, hey, you need to do this? And the universities just jumped and did it. Do not let your school turn into, a, I mean, of course, they frame it in a do not right. let your school turn into a pro-Hamas, right. uh, you know, protest, which none of these protests were pro-Hamas. It's absolutely right. ridiculous to, 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 and, to try to label them that way. And but, what was the time period again for this? When did that happen? Just oh, it was remind just our listeners. Oh, oh, this was April. The, the protest happened April 26th of 2024. So it was Got April it. of this year. Got the it. email from Jonathan Greenblatt was just in the days prior to the protest. Um, and the coordination between ASU and the ADL to shut down the protest before they had any inkling, inkling of what it was going to be um, right. was... You know, it's just astonishing they, to me. A, a lot of these places would never coordinate with Arab American or Muslim organizations. If we said, hey, we're really worried. Don't allow your university to turn into this anti-Arab Islamic folk. They would laugh at us and say, wait well, a minute, you, know, you don't tell us what to do. We only arrest people who commit crimes. In your case, they're ginned up to be ready. They're they're anxious about it. Two innocent guys walk into this thing. They get arrested and they're still suffering. Um, they what were they were not allowed to graduate, and you have to file suit to get their rights back. Um, among twenty four students, I think you said that you're representing twenty four. There's twenty now. There was a few others that dropped out because okay. they just couldn't handle the pressure anymore. Uh, and, and that's yeah. the other part of it, isn't it? That uh, this is the it's unbearable for normal people to have to be put in this situation. Not everybody can get a lawyer. Not everybody has the courage to want to stand up against the system, which is overwhelming. 
which was, I think, the the point of the arrests and the suspensions from school. It was to dissuade them from ever standing up again. And that is so anti-American in my yeah. in my view. It's 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 just crazy. It seems like there is this surge. I mean, it isn't dissipating, is it? This surge of anti-Arab and Islamophobic action. It's not reducing. No, it's going the other way. And 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 so I guess what I'll say is that is that our government uses the label of terrorism, right? Uh, l- l- labeling entities as terrorist organizations for political reasons, right? We can sanction uh, and we can sanction other countries who do business, you know, with uh, any organization or entity. So look, they said George Washington was a terrorist and I'm not, and I would never say that none of the actions committed by um, Hamas, for example, wouldn't qualify as terrorism. I think right. we're not even defending Hamas. What they did yeah. is horrible. Right. Right. So, so Sorry. what I will say though, what I will say is that if you can take an occupied people, um, people living under apartheid, people who are constantly being bombarded, mowing the lawn, and then condemn them for resistance, right? Violent resistance, armed resistance. That's how our country was formed, armed resistance to apartheid. And so you can't, you know, they label George Washington a terrorist. So I would just say that um, I have a hard time uh, without knowing any of the individual people in Palestine. I don't have a family there. I have a hard time looking at them and saying, you know, we got to blame them for for what's happening. They've been living under occupation for 76 years. I don't know what we would do if we were living under that system. So I know I know what I know what Americans did on January 6th. <laughs> it's with, when, when Donald Trump incited violence and our politicians incite violence against Muslims and Arabs every single day in this and, country. And nobody said anything. No, they say the opposite. They make it worse. Right. All right. My guest, David Chami, civil rights attorney, originally from Detroit and now in Arizona, representing uh, about 20 or more students there at Arizona State University. Is there a website? So I'm at David Chami on Instagram at TikTok. TikTok and consumerjustice.com. Okay. Consumerjustice.com and at David Chami. Um, if you want to try to reach our guest, uh, David Chammy, an attorney who looking at the terrible wave that has not subsided of anti-Arab racism and Islamophobia. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it. Have a great day, man. With more than 30,000 successful in vitro fertilizations, IVF Michigan is now ranked as one of America's best fertility clinics according to Newsweek magazine. IVF Michigan fertility centers are the recognized leaders in high quality fertility care. With locations in Bloomfield Hills and nine other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. A founding member, American Board Certified Dr. Nicholas Shama, is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. He has performed over 20,000 successful IVF cases and it's helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. When it's time to get personalized care from Dr. Nicholas Shama at one of America's best fertility clinics, call IVF Michigan Fertility Centers in Michigan and Ohio toll free at 855-952-9600. 855-952-9600. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted, and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain.
Thank you for listening to the Ray Hanania Radio Show brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network and sponsored by Arab News, the leading English language newspaper in the Middle East at ArabNews.com. We're broadcast every Thursday at 5 p.m. on WNZK AM 690 Radio. We're available online in addition to being live, obviously, at ArabNews.com slash Ray Radio Show and on Facebook.com slash Arab News. Get more information on me at ArabNews.com or on my personal website at RayHanania.com. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Bye-bye.